because we have less than an hour because some of the students have to leave 10 minutes to two. My introduction, my introduction will be short, okay? I want to greet you in the Iraqi way. Allah be khair. Okay. Uh, it's my introduction is going to be short to see an uncle's talk in order to allow maximum time for his keynote address on Al Mutalabi Street project. The Department of English and Comparative Literature will invite Sinan annually invites a distinguished creative writer to AUC. In this program, we have invited Egyptian Ahdat Aswaif, Pakistani Farah Ali, Somali Nuruddin Farah, Indian Hiram Desai, Irish Desmond O'Grady, Libyan Hisha Matar, and presently Iraqi Sinan Hamtoum. Sinan is a multifaceted artist. He is a filmmaker who has co-directed the documentary about Baghdad. He's an award-winning translator who has translated, among others, Mahmoud Darwish, Saad Yusuf, and Sargon Pauls. He has written three acclaimed novels that have been translated to several languages. He's also a published poet. As far as I know, in English, not in Arabic. In Arabic as well. There we go. A bilingual poet. And a co-founder of Jadalia, the electronic journal that I think you're, most of you are familiar with, as well as co-editor of the book al Mutanabi Street Starts Here. I should also mention that Sinan is also a first-rate scholar of Arabic literature. And he's an associate professor at New York University, having studied at the University of Baghdad, at Georgetown University, and at Harvard University. Sinan's specialties range widely. He has published, if I may divulge a secret, on taboo subjects. He has a book on the poetics of the obscene. And he has contributed to the Encyclopedia of Erotic Literature. He has also written on violence and exile, on trauma and memory. His topic today is Al Mutanabi Street, Topophilia and Violence. I don't know how many of you know the term topophilia. It sounds so tender when you pronounce it. Topophilia is love or emotional connection with a place such as the homeland. The slaving tenderness of a city or a street is contrasted in Sinan's title to aggressive violation. I want to announce another talk that's going to take place here at the same time in this room. We really have more chairs. We will be prepared next time by uh, Dr. Huda Sada, who is a professor in Cairo University and she's co-founder of Women and Memory Forum and she was the chair of the, uh, the Freedom and Rights Committee of the Egyptian Constitution and it will be the Madna Lamont Award uh, ceremony. So we'll celebrate the winning students in creative writing. Also, this talk is not complete unless you see the exhibits here of the uh, Al Mutanabi Street uh, next door. So if you have time after this, you can visit the exhibit. If not, it will be open other, other days until actually until the summer and so on. So, without much ado, let's applaud Sinan. Thank you so much, Professor Razou, for this wonderful introduction. I am delighted and honored to be uh, here and part of this distinguished lineage that you mentioned of the famous authors. Um, I'm also delighted and honored to um, give this talk and to be here for reasons that go beyond the obvious and the ordinary. Uh, I have the honor of being a contributing editor to the book. Uh, which is the nucleus of the project 
and of being active in the early stages of its evolution. But I'm also a native of Baghdad, who was formed and shaped by living the first 23 years of my life there, and by also becoming a student of the city's cultural history, and choosing one of its many great poets, who was a contemporary of Al-Mutanabi ibn Hajjaj, as a subject for my doctoral research. Not for instrumental reasons only, but to immerse myself further in the city's history and cultures, and perhaps to try to defeat distance, geographic and temporal. The exhibition and the project commemorate the horrendous attack on the Montenegro Street that took place exactly seven years ago, in Baghdad, seven years ago and one day. The history of the area around the street, which lies at the heart of old Baghdad, between the Rashid Street and the eastern bank of the Tigris, can be traced back to the late Abbasid period, when it housed shops and stalls of scribes and booksellers. The street was called Darb Zakha back then, and that's an Aramaic name. Its name then changed during the Ottoman period when military barracks were built nearby. And when the British occupied Baghdad, the headquarters of the military ruler remained there. And the street's name became Al Sarai, which is also the name of a very famous stationary market nearby, which is still exist, exists today. The street acquired its current name, Al Mutanabi, in 1936, when Faisal, the first king of Iraq, formed a committee of urban planners to designate new names for streets. Um, no one knows exactly what the reason is, but in addition to Al Mutanabi being probably the most famous Arab poet in the classical period, that he has one of his famous lines is, uh, you know, the, the best companion in the world is a book. During the 19th century, a number of bookstores and presses had already been established in, in the street. So it has an extensive, important history for, for the culture of the city. The bombing killed 30 and wounded 100. Many of the old buildings, bookshops, including the famous Al Maktab al Asriya, which dates back to 1908, were destroyed, as well as the famous Al Shahbandar Cafe was established in 1917 and is a favorite of the Rizarati in Baghdad. Three of the cafe owners' sons were killed in the, in the attack. al Mutanabi starts here, the name of the project, is an act, obviously, of solidarity and a reaffirmation of the power of culture and of the book and of art as a shield against bombs and violence. It is a very unique initiative started by an American poet and bookstore owner, Bo Bozale, who was joined later by tens of writers and poets and hundreds of artists all over the world. I say unique because it goes against the grain and against the political amnesia so prevalent in the United States, a particularly acute amnesia when it comes to Iraq and the U.S.'s crimes in and against that country. The United States has yet to recognize the extent of the damage and destruction it visited on Iraq and Iraqis by invading and occupying their country, by dismantling a state that was 80 or so years in the making, and leaving, in addition to the scores of corpses and carnage, a dysfunctional sectarian regime of corrupt crooks that have embezzled billions of dollars and destroyed what remained of Iraq's society and institutions. There was never a genuine open debate about the Iraq war invasion. More importantly and disturbingly, the very same architects and perpetrators of the war who lied time and again to their citizens and who should be tried as war criminals and would have had they been citizens of a less powerful country these criminals appear casually on talk shows and media outlets, write books and get their books reviewed, write op-eds, and pontificate about politics and about current crises as if their previous pontifications had done any good for anyone. Without ever being confronted or questioned about their role and their responsibility, except in a few situations, 
Maybe many of you have seen that sometimes Condoleezza Rice, when she, because she teaches at Stanford, at times she's confronted by activists in her courses. And the infamous General Petraeus, when he was hired by CUNY, uh, also um, there were many protests against him. Just before I came, I actually read that Condoleezza Rice was invited to be the speaker at the Rutgers graduation and to receive a $35,000 honorarium. Much higher than this honorarium. <laughs> <laughs> but the Council of Professors at Rutgers actually voted to uh, unanimously uh, disinvite her, so at least some of this is beginning to change. Iraqis, on the other hand, do not have the luxury of amnesia and denial. They have to live and die in the hell that was created by the US and its agents. Old agents and new ones. The Al Mutabi Street bombing took place seven years ago, as I said, but the dynamics that produced it and the conditions of its possibility are not in or of the past for Iraqis. Just yesterday, car bombs and explosions killed 14 people and wounded 60. Since January of this year, 1,790 Iraqis have been killed by bombings. I mention this to remind us of the painful reality, but also to make sure we remember the larger frames that produce it. And I think it is important to pose some critical questions about how we perceive violence and how we imagine or think we can resist it. We should, of course, stand in solidarity with its victims, but we should always think critically about the narratives we adopt to understand it or try to and narratives about its genealogy and history that sometimes we accept and reproduce uncritically. I will return to these questions toward the end of my talk. The project is also unique in the sense that by focusing its attention on al Mutanabi Street as a living cultural space, it forces audiences to read Iraqi culture as a dynamic culture in the present times and not a hostage of its past. Let me take you back to an example I often use in discussing how Iraqi culture, by and large, is often perceived in the US and in other parts of the so-called Western world. In the first week of the, of the war, um, the British Daily, The Guardian, published a story about one of the American units driving through southern Iraq and heading toward Baghdad. One of the soldiers told the British reporter that, quote, they had been driving for three hours and he had not seen a Wendy's or a mall or any sign of culture. <laughs> Do these people have anything? And the, quote. the reporter added that, ironically, the company was an hour away from the remains of the ancient city of Ur, one of the great markers of the ancient civilizations that crowd Iraq's rich history. The soldier was from rural West Virginia, ironically, again, a place usually ridiculed in American popular culture for its own perceived lack of culture. This crystallizes many of the issues at the heart of how Iraq, its history, cultures, and people are reproduced in the collective imaginary in the US. There is no doubt that culture and politics are intertwined and inextricable. And this assumes an added importance in times of war. Wars cannot be waged or perpetuated without dehumanization. The term Iraq would for a long time conjure the image of Saddam, the vicious dictator. The Iraqis, for the most part, were faceless multitudes that disappeared under his face or were morphed into his image. This doesn't only really apply to the US, it applies to the Arab world, unfortunately. The quote above does not only illustrate the ignorance, to say the least, on the part of average Americans of Iraq's rich history, but and this is not their own fault, but it also shows on the part of the author that even when Iraq is imbued with positive cultural value, it is not the culture of modern and contemporary Iraq, but of ancient Mesopotamia. So it's the usual oriental stroke of societies and regions that were great once in the past, but somehow now in the present they are at the bottom of the civilizational, the hierarchy of civilization. How did the destruction of Iraq come about and when did it all start? The manner in which one answers this question and assigns each force or event its historical role and the key moments that are under focus will determine how one reads or misreads the cultural and political terrain. 
The predominant focus on this last war, while understandable, can end up at times erasing a longer process of destruction that had started much earlier in the 90s, when much of the so-called civilized world was too busy or disinterested to even notice. The fall of Baghdad and the collapse of the Iraqi state, and we should remember that the goal of the war was not the removal of Saddam Hussein's regime. That's a byproduct, was to dismantle the Iraqi state. With all of its implications on the cultural field was a process, as I said, that had started much earlier. The massive material destruction unleashed in 2003, to my mind, was the final act in a tragedy that had started much earlier. One needs to tread carefully back in history in order not to be blinded by nostalgia or selective memory. Um, also, in order to appreciate the extent of the damage and the way Iraqis feel about it, one should say a few words about the type of cultural richness that we had. I can't go into details, but I should say that it is no exaggeration to say that by the beginning of the second half of the last century, and increasingly in the 60s and 70s, a very rich cultural and artistic landscape existed in Iraq. And its practitioners were at the forefront in the Arab world. Increased access to education and to the accumulation of experiments and experiences, together with the receptivity to the global radicalism of the 1960s, and the relative freedom of expression expanded the space for cultural production in Iraq, making it one of the richest in the Arab world. While poetry is certainly not the only form of cultural expression, it is, in the Arabic context and in Iraq in particular, a highly valorized and important form. And since al muhanabi spirit is hovering in the room, I'll focus on poetry a little bit. Um, it's also a locus of cultural symbolism and cultural capital. And the two most important developments in the 20th century in Arabic literature were the introduction of what has been termed free verse, the shar al on the one hand, and the prose poem, al al-Nasr, on the other. And these two innovations were the most important rebellions against what were perceived to be old forms that were no longer suitable for the modern era. And these two forms are now the most dominant forms of expression for Arabic-speaking poets. And both had their roots and beginnings in Iraq. A share of court for sure, a passage that never, the dust has yet to, set, to settle because there is a Lebanese claim, as usual, that everything began in Lebanon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, despite the destructive effects of dictatorship and the militarization of society during the eight years of the Iran Iraq War, Iraq's infrastructure, its state institutions, and resources emerged unscathed in 1988. This is very important. It is the 1991 Gulf War waged by the U.S. ostensibly to liberate Kuwait, but also to establish permanent military bases in the oil-rich Gulf that resulted in massive destruction of Iraq. General Schwarzkopf, who emerged as a war hero, said, quote, sorry, I, said, I mentioned this quote two days ago, but it's, this crystallizes everything. If you want to understand because this is a common question by fellow Arabs who mean, well, how, how did it happen that Iraq becomes what it is right now? Not that this answers it, but Schwarzkopf said, we have bombed them back to the Stone Age, to the pre-industrial age. So this part is simple. If you bomb a society back to the pre-industrial age, it's going to take a generation at least, if everything goes well, one would assume, to have that society come back from the pre-industrial age to where it was before. But after the, the war, we had the regime of the sanctions imposed, which made it, which made it, made sure that it would not get back on its feet. After signing the ceasefire and being forced out of Kuwait in defeat, Saddam would exploit the economic embargo to his benefit, accumulating wealth while Iraqis starved to death. The embargo which failed to force Saddam out of Kuwait, that's also important to understand what this, the, uh, the uh, charade that's called international law and, and, and uh, you know, that the embargo was put in place in the beginning to supposedly force Saddam to leave Kuwait. It did not work to force him out of Kuwait, yet they still kept it in place thinking it would produce other results 
for 13 years. So it's basically experiments with the lives of human beings. By all accounts, it was the most severe in modern history. Banning the regime from exporting oil, it also included a ban on importing the most basic needs for any society to function. This is important on all levels, but also for our cultural terrain. These sanctions ended up killing one million civilians, many of whom were children, and driving at least three million Iraqis, mostly of the middle class and intelligentsia, outside of the country, in search of life elsewhere. Most of Iraq's second or middle class and essential stabilizing factor and its intelligentsia, doctors, teachers, ended up scattered abroad. Hundreds and hundreds of writers and artists left Iraq as well to various diasporas, ranging from New Zealand to Arizona and everywhere in between. If you just read the literary outlets and newspapers, you realize when at the end the byline says Iraqi writer who lives in New Zealand, Iraqi writer who lives in Japan, Iraqi writer who lives, so it's, a, it's an amazing diaspora. But what of those who couldn't leave Iraq in the 90s and were forced to remain inside? What sort of material conditions did they operate under? And what did that entail for cultural production? It is difficult to underestimate the calamitous conditions under which they lived in the 90s. The collapse of the dinar, the currency and of the economy, can perhaps be imagined by one simple example. A professor's, a university professor's monthly salary could buy him or her two eggs. The transportation costs to and from work at times exceeded one's salary. So a lot of people just stayed home because it, it, it costs more than their salary to get to work. The erosion and destruction of the social fabric was visible everywhere. Writers and artists, of course, like fellow citizens, were forced to take on other professions and to sell all their belongings, especially books, to survive. This is the time when famous writers and intellectuals and professors would go to McAnambi Street and sell their entire collections. Even today, when you go actually to Baghdad, as I did, and you, you go through the books, you find books that these people had to sell. The lack of paper also. Everything was on that list that was considered dual use. Even pencils were considered dual use because the lead inside them could be used somehow to make weapons. And that is really even more criminal than bombing. The lack of paper made it such that it was not surprising to see a shawarma sandwich wrapped by a page ripped from a book. Many of the publications which provided a forum of sorts inside were discontinued, and so did the opportunities to publish or disseminate one's work. The embargo affected Iraq's ability to connect with the World Wide Web. Equally important and disastrous was the isolation from the outside of the world and the inability to have access to books or journals or for writers and artists to travel and attend conferences and festivals. I received, like I'm sure many Iraqis, there's uh, requests from students, they will not be able even to get anything from the Library of Congress. This really struggled, suffocated the, the cultural class in Iraq. The sense of isolation and abandonment would manifest itself in the cultural production of the period in form and content, especially in writing. There was an entire genre called the Kitabat al-Hasab. All of this was also terror, we should remember, and organized violence, but waged not by terrorist organizations, but executed through international organizations and condoned by the civilized world against a defenseless population. I'm sure many of you know, but when Madeleine Albright was asked on the famous American program 60 Minutes, three years after these sanctions, because it was obvious by then that the sanctions were killing defenseless civilians, or mostly children. Is the price worth it? Is the death of 5,000 children every month worth it? And she said yes. And when we tried to get that clip for our documentary, CBS did not give us that clip. Of course, later, Madeleine Albright would keep getting humanitarian prizes and things like that. So it is important also, after all of this, to remember the resilience and resistant human spirit of those who refuse to be defeated by a dual oppression waged against them both from within and without. So by 2003, I mention all of this so that we understand that when we get to 2003, things are already falling apart, which would then explain, which is a question that's still posed, how did the regime fall so quickly? 
The material and human resources of Iraq were so drained that it was no surprise that the country would crumble so easily, as its people were too drained and tired to care about occupation or about defending a regime that had oppressed them for so long, most of them at least. The void, political and otherwise, produced by the invasion and occupation was filled with chaos in every realm, and the cultural realms, institutionally and otherwise, are no exception. The profusion of newspapers and other media outlets was celebrated, and still celebrated at times, as a positive byproduct of the situation. While an increased space for expression and communication is always positive in principle, a brief look at many of these publications and outlets is sufficient to reflect their problematic nature. A few exceptions notwithstanding, they all have sectarian tendencies, and they're all just mouthpieces for this or that party. Very few of them are independent, one or two. And when, when they're independent, of course, they're, then there's a war waged on them by everyone. The chaos and the confusion in the political realm was echoed in the culture as well. Alas, the practices and discourse from Saddam's era are resilient and are reproduced anew. The content might have changed, but the form and the methods have not. More importantly, perhaps, the daily conditions under which all Iraqis live writers and artists or not, have deteriorized to an unprecedented low. The lack, for example, of basic necessities, electricity is still not back to pre-war levels until today. People in Baghdad do not get more than five hours. They all have to resort to generators, and you know how difficult that is for some people and what kind of problems it produces. And the lack of security, of course, and freedom of movement the destruction of Iraq's educational system, which suffered severe blows under the bath, and then because of the sanctions, continues as well. Almost 400 university professors were assassinated. We also have 30,000 fake diplomas under the new regime. And the Minister of Higher Education has a fake diploma. That says it all. And the Minister of Culture is the Minister of Defense. I mean, it is, it's tragic comedy. Al Mutanabbi was always the street, was always the stage where Iraq's politics and its culture and the relationship between the two were performed and experienced viscerally from the freedom and openness of the Republican period that followed the overthrow of the pro British monarchy in 1958 to the violent setback and crackdown against communists and others by the Baathists in their first coup in 1963, which was a US supported coup to the rivalry between the communists and the Baathists later in the 70s, and then to the heightened control and censorship and mobilization of culture in the 80s, during the height of the Iran-Iraq war, to the devastating embargo of the 1990s, and now to the chaos of the post-invasion era. The street was always a microcosm of intellectual and ideological rivalries, of literary trends and schools rising and ebbing, of maneuvering and dodging state power and censorship. Many of these booksellers, of course, were taken to prison in the 90s for selling books that were banned. And many of them, after the invasion, were attacked by sectarian militias and others for selling different kinds of books that are uh, unwanted. But always, all of this maneuvering and dodging with a thirst for knowledge and freedom. al mutanabbi himself, I will not say much about him because Professor Adam Talib is going to speak in the series about him. He will tell you everything you need to know. But al mutanabbi is, as a figure, represents the complicated and often problematic relationship between makers of culture and centers and structures of power. This struggle is still visible today, of course. The Iraqi regime, the current Iraqi regime rebuilt the street after the bombing. And the street has regained its vitality and is often the space for cultural and political initiatives and movements of protests against sectarianism and against corruption. There are always art exhibits, there are always activities taking place. It is an island, an island for those Iraqis seeking to salvage and resuscitate a cosmopolitan culture that definitely existed once before. Just three days ago, actually, booksellers and customers protested when the mayor of Baghdad tried to enter the street and they kicked him out. I want to return to the questions 
I mentioned in the beginning. The manner in which the attack on the Montenegro street is described almost always rep is represented in binary terms. It's an attack on culture, we hear or we say, on life. This reproduces the borders between culture. Culture is always here or there, where the speaker is and or where he or she imagines those like him or her are elsewhere in the world. So culture on the one hand, and then barbarism. Barbarism that's always out there with the others. Thus thinking of culture in a very neat and convenient way. But what of the barbarism within and at the heart of one's own culture? What of carpet bombing, sanctions, mines, and drones that kill innocent civilians every day and are doing it as we speak right now in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and elsewhere? Are these not also attacks against culture? Aren't they also, at the same time, part and parcel of a culture, Iranian culture? That's something that we should think about. So let's remember the street always, but let's never forget other streets, or the city itself, or other cities, or an entire country. So here are the dangers of this topophilia, in a way, or concentrating all of culture and history in just one place. Let us definitely celebrate the book and mourn the death of the bookseller, but let's not forget the humans who don't have the luxury of buying books, or the time to read them, or are even illiterate, and are still decimated by violence. They too are fellow humans, and their death should sadden and end us. Let us always be mindful of the destruction that is not carried out by anonymous terrorists that we can easily locate there, outside of civilization and culture. But destruction carried out by and in the name of civilization, rationalized by books and authors, and condoned or ignored, if not celebrated, by intellectuals and artists of all types. That's something, somehow, I think it's important to also demystify books, as much as I love them, that we should celebrate them. And I want to end with a poem that crystallized all of, all of what I said in a better way. I should have just read, read the poem, but that would have been inappropriate. Which is the poem I wrote in response to the bombing, and the responses to the bombing, which is called A Letter to al Muhammadi Street. <clears throat> you were right. Your words are still wings of light, always carrying you to us, sometimes carrying us to you. And your name is a green tattoo on face. And like that, your street is a forehead of a body beheaded every morning. It's just another chapter in the saga of blood and ink you do so well. I cannot lie to you. I am quite pessimistic. We are still etching on the walls of this cave, which is thousands of years long. Etching signs we keep reinterpreting and myths about the future world, where we don't devour one another, and where the sun is friendly and the seeds cannot inherit our fever. Some of us are digging a deeper grave, about to embrace us all. They too have their engravings, their maps, their philosophers and books. So we can only keep dreaming of a shore for the wind and dig wells in the dark with nails of silence and solitude. We will weave an ocean out of ink for our myths and out of words a sail or a shroud, vast enough for us all. Every book is a well around which we sit and drink to your health and try to live like you did with death and after it. of other places like Basra and other parts that have produced some of the best and most vibrant writers. So I'm not trying to hold on to it at all. Um, and like millions of Iraqis and others, I don't know. I mean, what do you do when you realize that the 
population state is a construct that has own congenital violence, but also you realize that there needs to be some framework for human beings and society to live. So you can't just, I don't believe in you know, dividing Iraq into three states, not because I think Iraq is some eternal trans-historical construct, but because I know that there will be disasters and, you know, Bosnia is already happening in Syria. So it's not out of any, you know, national fantasy. But what you said about rage and mourning and grieving is true in a way because I'm angry. Uh, I didn't want to say this because it's inappropriate perhaps, but in the evolution of this project, some of the problems of, about the way Iraq is dealt with in the U.S., all of them came to be. So for example, it started out with, you know, poets and writers, civilians, and then some of the U.S. vets uh, got on the bus. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I know soldiers are also victims of the class system, but someone who volunteered and then went to Iraq to be with the army, to kill people for whatever reason, then I don't think he or she can come back and then they too grieve. So what I wanted to say is that everyone grieves this anonymous violence, but who, I mean, who are the perpetrators then if we're all grieving, the soldiers and the civilians? And frankly, not to be too cynical, but there's always the danger of this just becoming about the booksellers and the artists. It's a, and to my mind is, why you only get enraged when a, a bookseller's market is bombed? What about, why weren't you enraged in 2003? Why weren't you angry at your own government? So there is a problematic tribalism that artists and, and writers have. And then it becomes some kind of fetish of the book. And come on, books are, we all love them, and some of the artwork is really beautiful, but it becomes some kind of, you know, liberal fest for everyone to get together and to absolve themselves of their responsibility as citizens. Because everyone forgets, you know, a large number of these intellectuals and academics and citizens who consider themselves leftists and liberals were on board with the war. And I mean, the reason why we should remember that, because it gets repeated again, I mean, you know that. So when, when I was showing the Iraq documentary around America, or talking, everyone would come up to me and say, what can we do? And I would say, back then, the next time the government comes and wants to bomb another country like Iran or Syria, just remember this entire charade. But they don't remember. So I'm angry also because, you know, there is nothing to do to control this, and there is so much erasure and obfuscation. And for, for us, I mean, there is in a way no space, no interlocutors that you can, you know, grieve together with. Uh, because I'm confronted with these things. Uh, it really angers me, not because I'm from Iraq. I don't think soldiers are victims. And maybe in a country where soldiers are conscripted, they're victims. But if you go and sign up, and some of these poets, they also don't have remorse now. So I mean, there's, they still kind of believe in the army and celebrate the army. So I don't think these people should, you know, should be welcome in any project that celebrates life. And so that's where the anger is, is uh, coming from. Thank you. Um, no, thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. But, um, can I ask, so, because uh, we had this sort of, sort of thing, I mean, we had, uh, Rabah was, you know, uh, let's say nine months ago, six months ago, sorry, and, um, and we also had the, the bombing of the museum. I mean, it wasn't, they, they didn't aim for the museum, but they affected the museum. In the, and it's very strange to be in that situation, because obviously I was appalled when a thousand people were killed in a day by the state, but I was also appalled when some lamps were destroyed. You know, and it's funny how one gets very emotional, very attached and, and uh, let's say, sort of romantic about the quote-unquote heritage of this country that's falling apart. I mean, on, in the end, you know, a Mamluk lamp is not going to save this country. But on the other hand, you know, something other than a biological entity is being lost. And then the other thing I was going to say is that, I mean, I, I attended both your talks and I enjoyed them both, but you didn't, um, you've not mentioned the Rithel Mudun, which is this great genre we have in Arabic, which yes. is kind of what you were doing today, right? In a way, no. There is no time. No, that's uh, that's the great thing and the sad thing. You know, for every emotion, that's why you know, classical Arabic literature is great because for everything there is a genre already. It's been said. No, what, what you said is important. I find myself in the same way that I, you know, grieve for the destruction of objects that have a certain, which is not bad. But the problem is there are human beings who grieve for the objects only and do not grieve for the human beings. Actually, it's an academic, uh, leftist academic, in an apartment in Brooklyn. 
who told me two years ago, sorry to be a doctor, but we are where you are from, you're from Iraqo, I'm really sorry. And then he said, you know, it's really horrible, but the human beings, you know, there are a lot of them, but it's the artifacts that I really feel excited about. And so, I mean, at least, you know, it's okay, of course, to grieve for the objects, but it's great because we also grieve for the human beings somehow. I mean, I jokingly say, I just hope that we can grieve in the West for human beings as much as we grieve for animals. Because another place I wrote, you know, had one million cats or dogs died in Iraq, everything would have stopped. So this is, this is the moment we live in. But this is problemophilia, because I mean, you know, people are sharing photos of the minaret of Aleppo or the market of Aleppo being destroyed and things like this. And, and they're somehow, I don't, I don't think they're more moving, but they are more, they're more distributable than images of people being killed. Right? I mean, no, you're right, you're right. I mean, I, you know, I'm not immune from that. I feel the same because I think for a lot of us, that is Baghdad, is those images and those structures and the words. I mean, it is, at the end of the day, a collection of images and a discourse. And it's all the, the human beings, but I don't, I don't have an answer. But uh, I'm uh, incorporating some of this a little I'm not in my in my current novel, but I mean, the, I mean the fascinating thing about Baghdad is that it was destroyed so many times already, even, but it's kind of the fantasy of its own, even during the, the Abbasid times. Thank you. Yes. Can I say something? <laughs> we'll give you a chance to get um, up. Do you have any advice for dealing with the resentment towards American soldiers? Because as an Iraqi American, I'm often faced with these guys who come up to me looking for some kind of salvation to tell them it's okay, you're a victim of this too. But I feel this resentment and... Um, no, I mean, that's a good question. I don't know because I, 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 I try, I boycott them actually. I've uh, gotten many invitations to read with them. And, um, and to participate in special issues. And what saddens me is that a number of Iraqi American and Arab American poets participated. So one of the events is called Home and uh, something, but they're all talking about the destruction of their homes, except for one difference. The Iraqis have their homes destroyed, but the vets still has his home. So it's like this equivalence, and I, you know, I'm sorry, it's not all the same, all experience. And to me, you know, civilians are different from soldiers because civilians do not choose to be in the war zone. They are not given the choice. Soldiers, American soldiers, do have the choice. And that's why there are, you know, refusings in there. But I don't know, it's, it's a problem. I, I try to be uh, civil, uh, but it's also something that's completely beyond. I mean, uh, these folks are victims of the class system. I mean, we know how, how the army conscripts, not conscripts, but how a lot of them are forced and are tra trapped into doing that. And a lot of them actually, I should say, a lot of them when they come back, they realize what kind of, you know, fraud was perpetrated on them and they change. But some of them, so this Brian Turner, on, on, on whose poetry I wrote an, an article in Arabic, is an award-winning poet, but the thing is about American culture is that this guy's poetry and a film like, uh, what's the name of the film, The Hurt Locker, are considered anti-war films when they actually, they reproduce the Pentagon's narrative. If you read carefully, like if you look at The Hurt Locker and in the poetry, it reproduces the narrative of the Pentagons. Somehow Americans find themselves in Iraq, right? You don't know how they got there. And then these Iraqis are either terrorists most of them are terrorists or potential terrorists. Really, that is the film. Or they don't speak, just like Palestinians in Spielberg's films. Or they speak and it's not translated. Because they have nothing to tell us. And then you identify with the soldier. And you go back to the narrative is, you know, how do we end up there? Of course, if you erase all the history of everything, somehow we're trapped in Iraq. And, and so the soldiers become the victims. And and the thing about The Hurt Locker, I'm straying, but it's amazing how in its production it reproduces all this. And my favorite quote from Benjamin about every document, document of culture, the document of barbarism. That film was done on a Palestinian refugee camp. And they used the black quarter folks to, co to help them produce the film. I mean, it's very unique. Um, 
So I don't know, but it's uh, not just to make it sound like it's so horrible to live and work in the United States, but uh, I mean, you're put in this awkward situation that you don't want to be uh, rude to these people, but it's true. That, you know, and somehow the pressure is always on us. Yes. So, but the hand can do the Okay. So, uh, we're giving the Syrian quote, and you get the more and more questions. <laughs> One thing that I found fascinating about your narrative. Uh, is actually it revealed to me something that was always there but I didn't put my mind around it. Is that when Schwarzko said we bombed it back to the Stone Age, uh, we could understand it to mean yes, we destroyed factories, we destroyed infrastructure. But I think the most important thing that was destroyed is uh, 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 life, so to speak, uh, yeah. connections between people uh, that are embodied in places like Mutan uh, like It's the idea of the public, uh, a place that strangers meet and actually encounter each other as strangers and something happens. And that actually has nothing to do with the state itself, has nothing to do with the... Uh, uh, so that's why I don't think you should feel apologetic about focusing on Mutan and like that, because Issues like this can only be spoken of concretely. Uh, and concretely means a, a street and a city. Uh, uh, so oh, that's, that's an, an excellent point, and that's definitely 1991, especially after 2003. And for those of us who visit, that public space has disappeared. It doesn't exist anymore, and it's an entirely male public space. But all of these issues combined together, you're right. I mean, if there is no public space where Iraqis of all different backgrounds and genders all get together, then I mean, that is what Iraq is. And if that's not there, nothing will sustain it. So one of the most dangerous things that they did after the occupation is to spatially divide the city and to allow the civil war to take place and to allow for this ethnic cleansing. So I grew up in a neighborhood, like so many neighborhoods, that you know the, the concept of mixed neighborhoods did not exist because all neighborhoods were mixed. The Americans introduced that. Because I grew up in a neighborhood where, you know, there were people of all kinds of backgrounds, Muslim, Christian, Sunni, Shia, Kurdi, Khalid. Now, with the walls, the concrete walls that were put, the Iraqis, Baghdadis grow up only playing and seeing people who are exactly like them. So you know how they're going to think of these others who are beyond the walls. Where, you know, they have horns or they have tails. And so that's, I mean, not to be too pessimistic, but all of these concrete material destruction it takes so long to fix if everything goes well. And, um, and now, actually, on the ground, there are, you know, concrete steps towards dividing the country. And the other interesting thing is that the different Iraqi factions, no matter how oppositional they were to each other, they never came up with the idea of dividing the country. It's Joseph Biden who came up with the idea but kept repeating it, and now the Iraqis have internalized it. And also because it's easier for the big oil companies to negotiate with one man or a local council than to go through a centralized state and a ministry of oil that has actually experts who know how to read these, these contracts. So, but we should end on a positive note. True Al Gramsci. Pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. No, actually, I was in Baghdad in April, and it's horrendous, but not, I'm going to sound like an old person. The only point of hope for me was that men and women, boys and girls who are 19 and 20 and 21, who are not encumbered by all of this system and all of that, and don't have the luxury of being... Uh, uh, you know, losing faith are working and are, you know, trying under very difficult circumstances, uh, producing art, uh, reading, and that's always a, a source of hope. And let's remember that around the time of the revolts, there were, there were massive demonstrations in Baghdad uh, that really threatened the regime. No one ever thought that that could take place. And history has, has taught us that, you know, everything is possible. The one thing I wanted to add in all of this is the danger of the situation here, of course, and how this evil, brilliant discourse of the war on terror 
is now, of course, you know, being used by everyone to completely decimate uh, and dehumanize the scores of others, and how so many of our colleagues and friends and famous novelists and all of that are all falling into this trap of colluding with, with violence. So, it's a dangerous word, I'll finish. Kids. Yeah, I'll <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>